<laughs> Good morning. Um, hopefully you all enjoy the keynote and the break that we just had. Uh, we are continuing today with our panels track um, and really excited for this session on Ruby's killer feature. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Chris, who's the moderator. Uh, Chris is the VP of Engineering at Radius Networks, where he builds mobile proximity tools and services. He co-founded the Arlington Ruby Group and helps organize both Ruby Retro Session and Ruby for Good events. Enjoy the panel. Hello. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go through and we'll do a quick introductions um, and uh, then we'll get started. Sorry, oh. it's you. Oh, it's me, introductions. Hi everybody, my name is Zoe Hunter. Um, I am a Howard University alum of Computer Information Systems major, um, and I'm also the woman who code Ruby on Rails lead in Washington, D.C., and I am a junior software engineer at Digital Globe. Hi, everybody. My name is LaToya. I am the founder of She Nomads, an inclusive space in tech for people who want to travel while working remotely, and I'm also a principal Rails engineer at Daily Coast. Uh, hey, I'm Sean. I um, Sean Marcia. I had slides for everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now we got a Sean. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. Uh, not the Sasquatch. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I help uh, organize the Ruby for Good and uh, Arnton Ruby, and I work for the government. Um. Government. Latoya already introduced herself. Okay. Allison introduced me. No one needs to hear any more about that. Um, one thing is, uh, we'd like to have your questions, and I put some uh, index cards in the front two rows um, up here, um, and if, if you can, I'd, I'd love it for people to come up, grab an index card, write down a question, and then you can just come and, and uh, hand it up to me um, if, if you'd like. Please feel free to do that. Um, uh, we'd, I'd like to be able to go through some of those. All right, so the actual panel. Um, so before we uh, go into the questions, let's get a little bit of context. So um, uh, can you just probably uh, the elevator pitch for one of the, the communities, organizations that you guys um, organize? Let's, let's go in reverse order from, from before, since Sean's holding the microphone. So, uh, so the pitch I like to give, uh, I, talk, I like to talk about Ruby for Good, and you've probably heard it and seen people wearing the shirts here. It's a, it's a long weekend, long event where we get a lot of people like us together and we help uh, nonprofits, places that really need our skills but would never be able to afford uh, you and me, and we build them software over a long weekend, and it's a lot of fun. So, as I said before, She Nomads is a space in tech for people who want to travel while they work remotely, and I think a big part of working tech is constantly working on your skill set. So we have free coding classes, study groups, an accountability group, and we also do a remote work and wellness retreat because I think those things are also important for us as people in tech. All right, and Women Who Code is a global nonprofit organization um, who is dedicated to creating a community and a network for women in tech or women who would love to be join tech. And for what we do, depending on the chapter, but in the BC chapter, what we do is we have weekly meetings across multiple subjects, so Python, Java, Ruby and Rails, and front-end work, and we host workshops, talks, and just basically give a support group for women who are interested in, who are in the industry and just share our knowledge. So one of the things I'd like to um, kind of set is, uh, originally when I pitched the idea for this panel was, um, I, I find it very intriguing folks working in, like helping with the, the, the community and uh, you know, moving it along, starting more groups, um, spinning things off, encouraging people to, to move up. Um, we had a wonderful uh, panel discussion uh, on the first day about getting involved in the community and, and how you can do that. This is a little bit um, more focused on the next step. You're already involved in the community or you're participating in the community and how can you step up and organize or if you're organizing, how can you um, evolve the groups you're in, spin out new groups um, and basically uh, build up the infrastructure that we as Rubius have uh, to rely on. 
So with that, uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, member engagement. Um, and so the, my first question is just, how do you get consistent members in, in the organizations that, that you um, help with? So um, for Women Who Code, we, the way we get consistent members is, of course, we had start off with feedback when we first get um, the ladies on board. So we like to figure out what topics they're interested in, whether uh, what topics specifically for our case, Ruby on Rails. Um, also the content, like we try to like put forth like the best content whatsoever. So we start, we go into really, we really hone a lot into the beginners. So we all, as we all were once beginners, so we all think of the things that beginners would like to know or don't know and just clarify it in our first timers night and then give them footsteps, I mean steps, into what is the next thing that they can do to improve on this and we like go along the way with it. So I think having that constant engagement with them, we use Slack, we leverage, we leverage Slack to the 100% extent, but keeping that constant engagement with, with them outside of our events is what helps them come back more. So it's really on like the leads as well as the community members to keep that going. I just pay attention to what people want. Um, I noticed that a lot of people were leaving other spaces because they didn't have code of conduct, so I got a code of conduct. Or I noticed that you know people were having problems getting jobs specifically at remote companies that would allow them to travel, which is a ton of fun. So um, I started a job board and we started pulling in sponsors for companies that were hiring to work in our um, newsletter. So I think just listening to your community and meeting their needs is super important. Yeah, and I'd also add that you need to make your members feel like they're part of the community, uh, engage them, have have them all speak when you have a have an event like like something we do at at our meetup is all the uh, all the people come we have them do an iceberg at the beginning tell them something interesting with themselves, and uh, if they're trapped in a desert island, what book would they bring? Um, uh, things like that, and 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 don't just like leave when the meetup's over. Like uh, engage the people, go go to coffee, go to uh, a nearby coffee shop. And, Build community. So, kind of spinning off of that, um, how how do you encourage people to actually either present at a meetup or step up and lead a project or participate at, at the next more higher level? So, I'm a big fan of just volunteering people to do things. <laughs> She's been voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Many times, so like a lot, a lot of people really want to uh, vol volunteer. They want to, uh, but they're, I feel a lot of them are just self-conscious. And so, like, just sit with them. It's like, hey, how about on this day? I, I know you've been working on this. How about you come and give a talk on this cool uh, Nokaguri scra scraping thing you've been doing? And then, then they do. I think for she nomads, because our events are typically remote. Um, it's just a really convenient way for people to contribute to the community. If someone wants to come in and teach a class or lead an AMA, they can do that. And then if there happen to be a bunch of people who are you know, in New York one weekend or Mexico City or Lisbon, then I'm like, yes, please organize a meetup and just have it under She Nomads and it works really well. So I wanna make it a little more specific for uh, Zuri. Um, so you, you run a lot of workshops. Um, how would you convince someone who feels like they might be too junior to um, lead or, or help other people out. Encouragement, like talk to them and be like, hey, you can do this. Um, you can do this. We can help you. We can help you put together the talk and everything. But I think um, the, the issue with that is they don't have, they're not confident in their skill when in actuality they know their stuff, even though they label themselves as a junior and, and whatnot. So what we do is we talk to them and like, of course, like talk about go over you know the stuff that they want to cover and just like guide them on that, and then hopefully push them to the next level in setting a date and promoting it for them to come through. So, um, similar question for Sean. So at Ruby for Good, one of the problems is finding people that can lead projects. Um, is is there a good way to take somebody who might feel like they're underqualified um, and encourage them into that sort of role? Yeah, definitely. Like in something we, we've started doing is we've. Uh, uh, like if, if you're a junior or you don't think you have the skills and if you're here, you have the skills, so come lead a project. But we'll, we'll find someone more senior in the community, uh, like a senior developer and, and, and pair them up and say, hey, this is your, your senior mentor 
and they will they will uh, guide you through the process. If you have any questions, uh, any anything at all, uh, come to them and they'll help you out. Excellent. Um, so I'd kind of like to change uh, the topic a little bit. Um, so um, Latoya, you mentioned the uh, code of conduct. Yes. Um, so how important uh, is it, or is there any specific uh, language or points that need to be made about um, a code of conduct when working with a, a community like this? Yeah, I think there's two things. Number one, have one. Number two, enforce it. <laughs> <laughs> when people start acting up or playing games, you need to remove them from your community. I think it's really important to provide a safe space for people. And I think Ruby in general does like a great job at that. But I would love to see more communities really step up um, and have a code of conduct, but also enforce it. So has have any of you had any specific times when you've had um, to actually deal with a conflict in, in your organization? How was that resolved? <laughs> uh, specific names would be best. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, well, so far since we started, we've actually had like a really great community. Everybody was respectful um, to each other, but we did recently have an incident, and what how we handled it, I think, was like absolutely phenomenal. But. First, we, we thought we should have something like, you know, a, a strike system, a three strike system. So if this is your like, you know, first offense and everything, um, we talked to that person and it's like, hey, we would like for you to not do that. Um, here's the reason why, this is our code of conduct. You know, we want to keep this as a positive, open, relaxed community, because you know, that would scare people away. Um, and if they repeat it again, we just rem like, you know, and remind them, but the third time around, we would like put them on probation and like keep them away and then like explain why. But the key thing is for us is to reach out to the individual to let them know like, this is not okay. Here's how we can like work with each other. If you're misunderstood, let's, let's like have this conversation. But um, there really is like to have, I realize that it's really good to have like a, not just, oh, you're out the community immediately, but more of like a strike system or just give them a chance of some sort. So one of the questions, the, the counter arguments I've heard um, sometimes is, um, we don't need more rules, why don't we just be nice or be polite to, to folks? Would you have a, a, a counter to somebody making that statement? I mean, I would say people have been fighting for equality in tech for over 50 years, so obviously we haven't figured out how to play nice. And when they're ready to do that, then we can maybe have that discussion, but until then, I think that's the least, like not having something, not having a framework for people to reference is like the least important part of that discussion, I think. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, so changing, changing uh, um, to more diversity and culture. Um, so just in general, how do you encourage diversity um, in the organizations? I'm black, so I literally just show up. <laughs> 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 you know, it's really not a problem for us. I think when we first started She Nomads, we really wanted to make sure that everyone was either already a part of an underrepresented group in tech or an ally to that group. Um, and I think because of that, we turned off a lot of people and our growth was very small, but it ended up serving us really well because we don't have those issues. Um, and it's been a really great experience. We actually just had a conversation about this, like the, uh, the leadership team of our meetup. And, and we, we recognize that we're not the, uh, the most diverse group. And one of the things we're, we're gonna do is we're going to add more organizers to our meetup, more people of different, that don't look like us, so when people come into the meetup and they see the person running it looks like them, they're more inclined to, to stay and take part rather than people who just look like us. Um, for women who code, like clearly it's all women, um, but we do come from very different diverse backgrounds. Um, one thing we, we've been like really noticing or like trying to keep in mind is like the area where we host our meetups as well as um, certain barriers that would prevent a certain particular group of women from attending. So that would be like, you know, people from different um, economic backgrounds 
who don't really have a car and they need like public transportation to get to our to our, our, our to our locations. So we try to you know put together events or talks and workshops that will eliminate those barriers for those people who have, for those women who have that different type of backgrounds, and like hopefully continue having that like diverse background on there. So, um, Sean, since Ruby for Good isn't aim specifically at um, a, a group that might be underrepresented. It's more of a general thing. Are there any steps that you take to um, encourage the, the diversity other than, you know, organizers that might not look the same? No, uh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, before registration opens, I'm, I'm always reaching out to, to diverse groups. And uh, if you do come to Ruby for Good, you'll notice that it doesn't look like a te typical tech technology event. We have a, we're very diverse, uh, like this year, I guess not including sponsor tickets because we have no control of who those go, go to, but 44% of the, uh, or I guess 56% is male and 44% is female. So that's a pretty good mix for a tech event. Um, so are there any specifics for, for uh, anybody? Uh, are there specific um, suggestions for if, so somebody here is a meetup organizer and they like to become, um, encourage more diversity. Um, What's a, a concrete example of something that you can do that would help encourage that? I, I feel like um, if you see somebody that's like, you know, doesn't really typically show up to your events, like reach out and talk to them and try to bring them under your wing or on board with what you're trying to do. I like when you like talk to them and it feels like they're more included, even though they're like, oh, why are you talking to me? I just want to look around and see what you're doing. But I feel like if you reach out to them and let them know, like, hey, I see you. I would like more people like you to come to our event. That will really help um, encourage them and make them a little bit more comfortable and like change the whole dynamics of yep. your, your meetups. So I'm going to chime in, even though I'm the moderator and I'm not supposed to. But specifically about this panel, um, uh, I wanted to find a, you know, somebody that wasn't a white dude, like myself. Um, and uh, the, the way we went about that was I talked to Allison, who helps with the conference, and I knew that she had connections. And kind of like Marco was saying in the keynote, um, you know, I know a person that knew a person, and then that, that was able to come through. Um, and in the end, I was super psyched and happier um, with how the panel turned out than, than what would have happened if I would have just gone out and tried to find somebody my, myself. So I think relying on those connections is, is a good go-to. Um, okay, so we talked about diversity of the people inside the meetup. I think there's also an important thing about diversity of um, meetups or groups that you're involved in. How do you encourage your members to kind of expand um, out to other parts of the community or things that you're not even necessarily involved in? Um, we usually like organize uh, meetups to crash other meetups, <laughs> but um, that's a way of how we do it. Like, say, I think um, if, I think it was uh, Arlington maybe, or I think there was something a meetup not too long ago that um, we decided to like. All right, instead of like having our own little one, let's go and attend theirs, and we just show up in a group. Um, and we do the same thing for DC Tech events too. Like a whole bunch of ladies from Women Who Code will come to the event and attend it. And hopefully that like encouraged them to feel comfortable in an environment where they don't have to come with us. But um, that's our way of like trying to branch out outside of just the Women Who Code organization. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, <laughs> Like even though we're, we're a Ruby meetup, like we like one thing we do is we uh, we encourage other other disciplines to come give talks at our meetup. Maybe talk about Elixir, talk about uh, one of the 600 JavaScript frameworks, um, or, or something. Because then you know they people come, they get introduced to to these different things, and and a lot of times it's uh, like an organizer or a member of these other meetups, and then they give them the, the resources to then go and uh, take part. I absolutely love linking up with other meetup organizers and just combining and doing events. I don't think I do it enough, actually. I try to do it quarterly. But um, for example, we linked up with Chicago 
Pi ladies, and we did um, an event with them called 100 Days of Commits, and we had them come in and teach a class for us too on building Twitter bots, which was really cool. So I think just joining forces is a great thing. So, uh, I definitely, you know, there's a, a certain amount of um, overlap between different meetups or maybe similar meetups within the same uh, geographic area. Uh, so a couple of us are from DC and we have a, an amazing tech community there. Um, however, I remember it was, it was something like uh, six years ago this month, um, I'm just guessing, that Arlington Ruby was started, um, which, you know, there was already DC um, Rug, Ruby yeah. Users Group, and there was um, Nova Rug. Um, and so Arlington is kind of both of those. So um, obviously Sean was vindictive trying to take away from both uh, DC and Nova and crush them and, and take over the whole area. Um, how, how do you feel, like how did you feel when uh, Reston on Rails started and, and decided to do the same thing to Arlington Ruby? No, I, I was I was happy when Reston launched their their inferior meetup. Um, no. I'm joking. No, no, uh, it was like I I was happy. Like it's it's it just shows the community's growing. There's there's more people, and like I I was really excited because like more talks, like more chance for me to learn, and just more people coming into the community. And like and the reason we started we started Arlington Ruby was like DC Ruby at the time was. Was always full. People couldn't get in, and so we were like, "Well, let's let's you know let's start our own." And we all live in Arlington. Like we don't we didn't live in the district, and so it just made sense. So Zuri, I know that there are sim very similar groups um, in DC also doing uh, uh, things. Um, do you, you feel like that more options are, are is better? Of course, of course. Um, there are certain topics that they will probably cover that we don't get a chance to cover. So the more options, the better. So we can have like the ladies explore what they want to like be interested in. But yeah, the more options, the better. And obviously, Latoya, you want to be the only <laughs> online. I want to be the only online meetup. Yeah, for ever, people who for travel anything. ever for yeah. anything. No, I mean it's the same thing. Um, for me, especially, I w would love more help. Actually. Um, there's so many people that are like on the other side of the planet who want to do things and I'm sleeping at that time or vice versa. So like I would love to be able to say, hey, I have these like 10 users on your side of the world. Here you go. Um, the reason I, you know, I'm, I'm asking these hilariously worded questions is um, just want to impress upon the folks here that as organizers, we're thrilled when somebody else opens up next door doing the exact same thing. It's uh, the more groups, the better. And the more we build out the community, it's gonna be slightly different for different people. Um, and th they'll just click with other folks and then they can work together. Um, right now there's lots of overlap as, you know, with Arlington Ruby and Silver Spring Ruby and the DC Rug and Rest on Rails and then, you know, it can all come together for local conferences and other events, uh, crashing meetups, which is fantastic. Um, so, Super fun. Yeah. <laughs> So if you're like thinking, ah, I'd like to do this because I really don't want to drive for, for 20 minutes to go to a meetup, you should start one um, and, and highly encourage that. Um, all right, so um, I have, a, let me go through a couple of questions. So I want to start with um, Latoya. Um, so Chi Nomads is online virtual meetup, mm -hmm. but somehow you ended up doing a co-located event where um, you brought a lot of people to Mexico. How did that come about? So when I first started traveling while working remotely, um, I didn't, I found that I couldn't find community, right? It's like if I'm in New York or something, there's a ton of meetups, I can go and meet people. And I just found that um, a lot of people who are having we're having the same problem, you know? It's like, you wanna get out of the US and work somewhere else where it's cheap and the food, I mean, hello, Mexican food's just amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanna go and have that experience and still be able to get your work done, how do you find community? So I kept going down to Mexico City and then I kept trying to convince my friends who are working remotely to come with me and they kept saying no. So finally I said, you know what, screw you guys, I'm just gonna like 
throw a website up and see if anyone wants to sign up. And no one showed up? And then like a ton of people ended up applying, which was great. And then um, I ended up hiring a yoga instructor who taught us yoga like twice a day. And we got to explore this amazing culture and get to know each other and we all worked as well, so. So did you find there was a lot of value in that actual co-located FaceTime? Absolutely, I feel like I've gotten to know them a lot better and it just energizes the community, I think, as well. Uh, so this is for Sean. So um, originally you organized a Ruby retro session um, and somehow you were able to parlay that into Ruby for good. So first can you ex kind of give a little background of what a Ruby retro session is and then how you use that to evolve into a, a much more complicated thing to organize? Sure. So like a retro session, it's a one day unconference, so which means we just all get together. Day of, we decide what the topics are going to be and then we just talk about it, and it's a lot of fun, it's great for community building, and um, <clears throat> not quite sure how that evolved into Ruby for good. Like, something to do with my kind of like efficient brain and like hating inefficiencies, because you, know, you talk to the, like, you know, work with nonprofits or meet nonprofits, and you hear about like the horrible way they're doing things, and we, uh, you know, as software developers, we have this amazing ability to, to help, and it doesn't require us to do much, like just for how little, uh, little help they need, and uh, so that, uh, kind of, it's like, hey, we can help these people, and, and probably a little bit of guilt in there too, because you know, as software developers, we have it pretty good. We make a lot of money, and uh, everyone's trying to give us jobs, but not everyone's so lucky. So, so Siri, um, I'm kind of curious what the secret sauce is in taking someone that's um, like a total beginner and helping them through. Uh, all the way to like getting their first job. The secret sauce is sugar, spice, and everything nice, I'm kidding. Um, honestly, it's really encouragement and boosting their confidence. So um, really figuring out what they really wanna do. Do they wanna do front end or back end or you know, do they wanna do Ruby on Rails? And then from there, just guide them, check in on them. It's slowly almost like, you know, a micro mentorship going on. So you're not like 100% like interface every week, but just like doing checkups to figure out like where they are, if they come across any issues. Um, and just really guide them and push them and encourage them. And then like have them come out to more meetups, have them actually become a Ruby on Rails lead. So, um, so far, we've like had people who become leads with the women who code, who started off like coming from a different industry, or who started off as like self-taught um, developers, and we watched them grow. We watched them give their talks and everything, and we encouraged them. And then from that point on, they're able to build that confidence, and then like they start applying to jobs, and then boom, they're finally in the industry. But I think when you bring them more involved in the community, it helps really put them to the next level within their tech career or get into the tech industry. So really just having that constant connection, monitoring, you know, encouragement, the network, like really, the network really help us out a lot um, to help bring them into the next level. So that's our secret sauce. So that's sugar and spice and everything nice. So it seems like you, you get a, a a fair amount of control over their beginners. You help them level up. You can you can kind of help them to become a lead um, and get more technically savvy. Um, but that last step is really hard. Going from you know, or even just getting the interview, mm -hmm. and then um, you know starting the job. And and the the terror that can sometimes go through people's minds as they feel like they're jumping in into this big commitment. Um, how, how do you handle that? Um, it's to, really, it's like the constant reminder to let them know, we are here for you. If you need to vent, if you need to talk about like your first day or the interview process, we are here. Like this is what Women Who Code was for. Like we are, we are here for you to communicate, to really boost up your confidence, be your cheerleaders actually. So that's how like we really like tackle that. And um, what else? Yeah, we really like tackle that part. Um, I really would. Latoya, do you have a similar, do you, do you ever work with that first interview? So the interesting thing is that um, I think because we're so focused on 
um, people who work in tech who can travel, we get a lot of mid and senior and like director level people in our community. So when the new people come in, I don't have to do much work to be perfectly honest. I can kind of sit back and we have a lot of people that are often willing to help them mentor on the fly. Um, I mean, you can you know screen share, you can use Tmux to SSH into somebody's computer and we definitely encourage that, so. Uh, so, Sean, I know at, at Arlington Ruby, we've definitely had folks walk in the door and they said, I don't know if I'm even supposed to be here. Um, and we've watched them move all the way up. Um, it, just in watching those folks, do you think there's something specific that organizers should be doing to help or, or uh, encourage those people? Definitely. Uh, mentorship, uh, trying to find members, uh, uh, mentors, try to uh, like, just encourage them and just be there for them. Uh, like one thing, one thing I know a lot of the organizers of our meetup t we do is we do a lot of mock interviews with the people. Like I probably do one, one or two a month with different junior people before they go out for their, their first interview or their second. And so just like help them any way you can. So changing, changing uh, gears a little bit to talk to mentorship, which was a fantastic segue. Thanks, Sean. Um, so how um, do you go about finding people to be mentors? John? So, um, so I knew he was going to talk about mentorship, so I had to. Uh, so, so the first thing about mentorship is, like, it is a relationship, and you, you have to understand that, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, because it's, it's two personalities, and, and um, I, was, I was talking to uh, my mentee, and she said to me, uh, she said, I knew you were the, men the mentor for me because of all the great advice you've given me. And I, I've given great advice, and then she, uh, she clarified, and I, I wrote them down, because I want to share them at some point, and the advice I've given is, don't be nervous about speaking at RailsConf, just get drunk first. <laughs> if that 70-year-old lady at the nonprofit you're, you work at is bugging you, just fight her. <laughs> when interviewing, uh, tell whoever's interviewing you that you're good luck to hire you. Uh, tell them how every person who hasn't hi hired you has had a house fire afterwards. <laughs> So, so obviously, I, there's a particular sense of humor, and we match up. But, uh, but yeah, so it is a relationship, and you need to uh, find the right person. So as far as mentorship goes, I would not be here if it weren't for mentorship. Um, I dropped out of college twice, and I was bartending until 5 in the morning when I started to learn how to code. And I was like lost for a year, and then I ended up getting a mentorship at a company called 8th Light. And I was able to take a lot of the good things that came out of that program, I think, and kind of implement them. And I think just because of my experience, I'm just always willing to help people who want to learn. So I think finding other people who have who for some reason want to help to learn is a big help. Yeah, um, Women Who Code, uh, we are still trying to figure out like a nice formal process in doing this, but um, more so, I think it's more like people don't know that like that person's actually my mentor, but like I haven't told them yet, but I do go to them for questions. I do go to them for like, you know, some advice on something, but I think, um, for us leads, what we do is like we reach out to them afterwards, like after our events, and see like, hey, would you like to, you know, have one-on-one -on -one discussions in regards to, you know, whatever you're interested with in the field. And I've done that like several times, having FaceTime, um, not FaceTime, yeah, Skype, Google Hangout, and I just talk with them and figure out like, hey, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to do? Let's, you know, try to meet every two, three weeks on like, whatever subject or whatever, whatever project that you want to do, and we, I can help hold you accountable for it, and we can work through this, and any questions that you have, like, I'm here for you. So really taking, like, our extra time outside of just organizing our meetups and reaching out to our members to help monitor them and, like, give them, like, advice is, like, one of our informal ways of, like, doing our mentorship cycles. So one more quick question about mentorship, and then I'd like to open it up um, to audience questions. Um, so do you hope to always have a mentor? Of course. I will be, do I hope to always have a mentor? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have so many unofficial mentors. Um, Jenny Hendry was one of mine. Um, Ray Hightower, I don't think he even realizes that he's been my 
uh, mentor for like five years. <laughs> and I'm always looking to you know, grow and expand myself. And I think the only way that you can do that is through mentorship. Definitely, definitely. I hope I always have one for the rest of my life. Right, you, yes, everything she said. <laughs> Actually, um, of course, yes, I hope to have mentors. Um, also hope to like have mentors across different realms in the industry or different topics, like not necessarily always in tech, but you know, a career mentor or someone on like life. <laughs> but the I, I think for me, like what I would like to work on, and I'm sure everybody would like to work on, is getting mentors with different tricks and trades. So it really will give you like well-rounded advice and a well-rounded guide on navigating and wherever you're going. Great, so we have about five minutes left. I saw one person take a card. Did you have a question? Yeah, my question is, how important are the meetups to maintaining a community and keeping connected? So the question is, how important are the meetups to maintaining a community and keeping connected? Well, in this context, what is a meetup? Like, are you talking about meetup.com? Actual events. Actual events. Yeah. I think they're really important. I think they're the... Um, the foundation. So is it kind of actual community. event, like, as opposed to a conference? As opposed to, like, you have the Slack and the... Uh, oh, okay. I think the in-person, like, stuff really, really, truly goes a long, long way. Um, I think that's, like, really fundamental, because it, it really, you see the person, you see the face, you, you can read body language a lot better, as opposed to, you know, doing this through text, honestly. Body language, like, is basically close to, like, 90% of communication. So the physical location part is like super, super important. And it really helps out with everything. Yeah, definitely, and it helps set up, uh, you, you can create opportunities for mentorship, like have, have new people uh, bring, bring code samples or bring code that they're working on and that they need help. Like we always encourage our new members to like, hey, if, if you're stuck on something, bring it and someone will help you. And oftentimes the person that's helping them, that will blossom into a, a mentorship situation. I want to add to that really quick. Since everything we do, or 90% of what we do is remote, I will say that like for us, a meetup might be, there's a bunch of people online on Saturday asking questions about GitHub. Why don't we just do a giant GitHub review? And then there's like 10 people that are just doing it then. And I feel that that works really well for us. Come so, hang out in my community. <laughs> so just to repeat the question, is um, how can people join um, a more global or remote community and, and be involved in that? Um, Sounds like a question to me. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, when people come into the community, I try to welcome them personally. I ask them a couple of questions. We try to get people to do introductions. And then I just talk to them a little bit and see like what we can do to help them feel a sense of community if they're looking for anything specific. And I, since everything's online, like I said before, the turnaround time is really quick. If they're like, I need help with my resume, okay, then like let's throw something on the calendar for next month or next week. So Ruby for Good has done um, remote leads. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so in, in the past years, we've, like one of the teams, or we'll, we'll do one team where we get a remote lead and have a remote team, and we're debating doing it this year too, so if that's something really appealing to you, come find us afterwards. I think we have time for one more question, anybody? All right, great, thank you so much for coming out, I appreciate it.